All right, this week we are going to study the respiratory system and uh, the integument. So we'll begin with the respiratory system. Here is a schematic of the respiratory system. Here you have the uh, the naso and oropharynx, uh, the laryngeopharynx. We're going to start today uh, examining the histology of the of the uh, larynx, and uh, then we're going to look at the trachea and various uh, bronchi and bronchioles of various sizes, um, which uh, comprise the conducting and then the respiratory portions of the respiratory tree. So this is a coronal section through the uh, larynx. There are two pairs of folds above a uh, cavity or, or uh, ventricles. So these uh, white spaces right here are known as the laryngeal ventricles. Um, superior to the laryngeal ventricles you have uh, a pair of folds which kind of look like vocal cords but they don't move or contribute to vocalization and so these are referred to as the false vocal cords. Inferior and somewhat medial to the uh, false vocal cords you have the true vocal cords which uh, possess vocalis muscles um, underneath and uh, you can see that there is a little glandular uh, epithelium associated with the true vocalis muscles where there is significant glandular epithelium associated with the false vo uh, vocal folds. This is a hemisection of the larynx and so here you can see the laryngeal ventricle. This is the uh, false vocal cord on one side. Again, this ba these basophilic structures here you're seeing are the glandular part of the epithelium. This is the true vocal cord. You can see the uh, skeletal muscle uh, underneath the superficial layers of the, the true vocal cord. The epithelium that lines the larynx like uh, most of the rest of the upper respiratory tract is composed uh, primarily of PCCE. There is a place on the true vocal cords where it transitions into stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Um, this helps to prevent damage to the underlying tissue because uh, this part of the vocal cord is, is rubbing together very actively during vocalization. So the, uh, this epithelium here helps uh, provide protection. Further down, the epithelium transitions back into PCCE. So make sure you can identify the transition point under your slide. I uh, don't have a uh, high magnification image of that particular transition point here. Um, here's some PCCE here. Uh, again, here's stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium where you can see the transition point here. But uh, try to find this particular transition on your own slides at a higher magnification. This is a schematic showing the general structure of the uh, trachea which bifurcates to form uh, a series of further bicating tubes, bifurcating tubes called bronchi. Uh, eventually bronchi become small enough in diameter that they're referred to as uh, bronchioles and uh, bronchioles continue to uh, bifurcate and subdivide until a point where they're known as terminal bronchioles, um, which marks the end of what is referred to as the conducting zone of the respiratory system. That is, air is conducted uh, through these tubes, but there is no exchange of gases because the epithelium is too uh, is too thick. So uh, after the conducting zone you have the respiratory zone um, where you can find the presence of alveoli which are these small uh, sac-like structures, little spherical structures. They're composed of simple squamous epithelium. Here the epithelium uh, is thin enough that oxygen can efficiently diffuse uh, through there into the uh, blood of the this highly, highly vascularized portion of the lungs. So um, the terminal bronchioles then mark the end of the conducting zone. Once you start to see alveoli, you're now part of the respiratory zone. Uh, 
don't worry about transitional zone here. We're essentially uh, ignoring that part here. So this is a plate from Netters that shows uh, the trachea here. Uh, where it's bifurcated into two major bronchi going into the um, uh, left and right lungs. And then you can see these bronchi continue to subdivide, becoming smaller as they branch off. These bluish colored structures uh, in the illustration are um, rings or plates of hyaline cartilage. So the trachea is reinforced by rings of hyaline cartilage that go almost completely around the circumference of the trachea, but they are in fact uh, C-shaped. So uh, here's an actual cross-section of, uh, of the trachea, and this is a ring of cartilage, and you can see it's kind of a C-shape. It is notably absent on the posterior region of the trachea. That's because the esophagus sits back here, so when you swallow a bolus of food, the esophageal wall is going to press against the back of the trachea and the absence of, of cartilage here uh, allows a little bit gi of give so the esophagus can actually stretch so you can swallow properly. Uh, but the presence of hyaline cartilage around the rest of the wall, the trachea is essential to uh, provide a rigidity to the tracheal wall so that it doesn't collapse on itself um, as you inhale. Uh, due to the negative pressure. Here's a section through the trachea and uh, we have looked at uh, this slide before. Um, so we looked at the epithelium and we've also looked at uh, the cartilaginous ring. So here you can see uh, three of the different rings of the trachea in longitudinal section. Here's the epithelium. Here uh, are some uh, glandular tissue underneath the epithelium there in the wall of the trachea. Um, here's a high magnification view of the epithelium which is classified as PCCE, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. You can see the cilia up here. That should all be uh, generally reviewed for you. Here is a, another plate from Netters which is showing uh, the lower part of the respiratory tree. Up here we have uh, bronchi and uh, you can see where the bronchi are continuing to uh, branch off and the diameter of the bronchi decreases. Uh, eventually they become small enough that uh, they are referred to as bronchioles. But another major difference between bronchioles and bronchi, which is easy to distinguish them histologically, is the absence of uh, cartilaginous plates in the bronchi in the bronchioles. So notice in the bronchi there are uh, not C-shaped cartilaginous rings, but rather the cartilage is organized in plates. These plates become fewer in number and further apart as the uh, bronchi become smaller in diameter because they're less likely to collapse at that size. Eventually they become small enough that they don't need hyaline cartilage to reinforce them at all. And so that's the point we would refer to them as bronchioles. So um, if there is no hyaline cartilage visible, we're going to refer to these structures as uh, bronchioles. If there is hyaline cartilage, we call them bronchi. Um, on the right here you see the end of a terminal bronchial right here, which is the end of the conducting portion of the respiratory system. Again, no gas exchange is occurring here, uh, but you can see that uh, further down you start to have these sac-like alveoli that are attached to the surface of these uh, bronchioles. So at this point where alveoli appear, these bronchioles are referred to as respiratory bronchioles. So this would be a conducting bronchial. This is a respiratory bronchial, even because there's a even though there's a single alveolus um, on the wall. Notice that the number and density of uh, alveoli greatly increases the farther you go down uh, the respiratory tree. Uh, eventually the, the wall of the passageway, respiratory passageway, is composed of uh, almost completely of alveoli and at that point we call it a uh, respiratory duct. So respiratory bronchioles terminate into uh, respiratory or alveolar ducts.
and alveolar ducts terminate into these uh, blind structures which are grape-like clusters of many alveoli. These structures are known as uh, um, alveolar sacs. So uh, there's often some confusion about the term alveolus and alveolar sac. An alveolus is a single um, spherical sac-like structure. So here's one, here's another one, here's another one. But this entire cluster of alveoli is known as an alveolar sac. So let's see what some of these structures look like in actual histologic sections. Um, and uh, the, the lung, when you first appear at it, uh, it seems to have a pretty chaotic uh, structure. Some of the structures can be a little hard to identify. So this is certainly one I would spend some time, maybe read through your basic histology text to try to understand it because of the uh, uh, extensive three-dimensional branching structure of the lung. Um, sometimes it's hard to, to visualize how all these uh, structures actually uh, appear in histological sections when you're taking a, a simple slice through it. So this is a low magnification view of the lung. You see a lot of empty space here. Um, that's because uh, uh, the, the lungs draw in a lot of air, so there's a lot of empty space for the air to pass through. Uh, you can see some blood vessels at low magnification and you can see a, a bronchus here and some other uh, larger respiratory structures. So let's take a closer look at some of these. This is a cross section through a bronchus. Uh, you don't need to be able to, to have to uh, measure the diameter of this tube to know it's a bronchus. You can identify it as a bronchus because of the plate of hyaline cartilage that you see here. So. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with hyaline, what hyaline cartilage looks like at this point. It has that uh, somewhat basophilic, glassy appearing matrix. So here's a plate of hyaline cartilage, so we would identify this as a bronchus. Here's another little bit of hyaline cartilage on the wall of this bronchus over here. This structure we would classify as a bronchiole because there is no visible hyaline cartilage in its wall. Here's another bronchiole down here. Here we have a bronchus which has a very small little bit of uh, hyaline cartilage in its wall, but it's there, so we still classify this as a bronchus. Here's another bronchus. Here's another one down here. This is a blood vessel which appears to have ruptured, leaking some of the blood into the uh, pulmonary spaces here. This is an example of uh, another uh, bronchiole. Again, notice the absence of car uh, hyaline cartilage. Here we can see a terminal bronchiole that is transitioning into a respiratory bronchiole. There are a couple features that mark this transition that you can see. You can uh, tell this is a respiratory bronchial over here because you can see the walls of the alveoli. Now notice that some alveoli, depending on how they're sectioned, you can see uh, complete walls uh, in, that are intact in those structures. But because they're very thin and three-dimensional, a lot of in a lot of sections, you're only seeing parts of the walls of the alveoli. So you kind of have to use your imagination to fill in the rest of it here. So here's one, two, three alveoli here attached to this bronchial. So this would be a respiratory bronchial. Since this is the terminal end of the conducting portion of this bronchial here, this is classified as a terminal bronchial. Notice there are no alveoli um, that are part of the wall of this bronchial here. Another difference that you can tell between a terminal bronchial and a respiratory bronchial is notice the transition of the epithelium. The epithelium of a terminal bronchial is simple columnar um, and you can see it flattens out uh, becoming a simple cuboidal in a respiratory bronchial. Here's another terminal bronchial with that uh, thicker epithelium uh, and here you can see it uh, branching off to form two respiratory bronchioles. Here is a little bit of terminal bronchial. Again, you can see the columnar epithelium. Uh, 
uh, that is branching off into respiratory bronchioles. Uh, here we actually have some uh, alveolar ducts where uh, the walls of, of these are composed mostly of alveoli and uh, you can also tell these are respiratory ducts because they terminate in these blind alveolar sacs. So here's an alveolar duct termin terminating into an alveolar sac. Here's another duct terminating into an alveolar sac and here's another one over here. Uh, here's another section of an alveolar duct uh, again terminating into this alveolar sac which is that blind like structure. So that's it for the respiratory system and uh, now we'll talk about the integumentary system. So integument refers to skin and there are two major parts to skin. You have the epidermis which is composed of a stratified squamous keratinized epithelium and the other part of the skin uh, is not an epithelium but rather it is uh, condensed irregular connective tissue which is the dermis. Uh, as we're going to see, there are different layers to each of these structures and uh, the epidermis in particular is quite a bit different on different regions of skin de depending on whether you're looking at thin skin or thick skin. So on this particular section we have a section of thick skin which is found on the palms of your hand or the soles of your feet um, and uh, it has a much thicker epidermal layer than thin skin has where it, which is how it gets its name in thick skin there are uh, five distinct layers of the uh, epidermis that you can visualize so we're going to talk about each of these layers starting with the basal most layer which is uh, immediately adjacent to the uh, underlying dermis here so the basal most layer which is tends to be more basophilic than uh, the superficial layers is called the stratum basal you can remember that because it's the uh, basal most layer uh, these cells are typically uh, cuboidal to columnar in shape they have uh, dense uh, basophilic staining nuclei. Um, these cells have a high rate of mitotic activity so uh, they proliferate at high rates uh, to regenerate the upper epithelial layers which are constantly sloughing off. So here we have stratum basal can be several layers thick. Um, superficial to the stratum basal you have the next layer which is called the stratum spinosum. The stratum spinosum gets its name because uh, in some sections when that are treated with standard uh, histological stains such as H and E, uh, you can see uh, intermediate fibers, the tonofilaments that attach to the uh, desmosomes. Uh, much of the cells tend to shrink back, but it, it causes these uh, uh, intermediate filaments of the desmosomes to really stick out and it gives them a kind of spiny appearance so uh, that's why it gets its name stratum spinosum. You may or may not be able to see the spines uh, on your slide. Uh, in order to, to see them you'll need to look at uh, high magnification. So the stratum spinosum is a relatively thick layer, um, thicker than the uh, stratum basal typically. Superficial to, the s superficial to the stratum spinosum, you have this uh, densely uh, staining basophilic layer which is called the stratum granulosum, so called because of the presence of numerous granules uh, in the cytoplasm of these cells. This is only a couple cell layers thick and uh, this really marks the uh, last layer of living cells in, in uh, stratified keratinized epithelium. All the, all the cells above this layer are essentially dead. These uh, partly that's due to the fact that these cells are uh, producing glycoproteins that help to uh, form a protective hydrophobic uh, barrier above them and so that also prevents nutrients from being able to diffuse and sustain these cells which is partly why they die. Superficial to the stratum granulosum uh, you have 
this translucent appearing uh, fairly clear layer which is called the stratum lucidum uh, that refers to it being lucid or clear, which is what that means. So if you're thinking lucidly, you're thinking clearly. So that should help you remember the name of this layer. Stratum lucidum is only visible in thick skin. So if you see this very distinctive layer, that tells you you're looking at thick skin. And finally, superficial to the stratum lucidum, you have the th thick stratum corneum layer, um, which, uh, like the cells in the stratum lucidum, are dead, but it does not have that translucent appearance. Um, you cannot see nuclei in the cells of these layers. Uh, these cells are basically dead and impregnated with uh, large amounts of, of keratin, so they're essentially dead cellular husks. So here's a higher magnification view and we can go through all these layers again. Here at the basal portion of the epidermis you have the stratum basal. Here you have the stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum. It is important for you to be able to identify each of those layers for the quiz and for the practical. This is a section through thin skin, and uh, you can see it gets its name because it's much thinner. This is all of the epidermis from here to here. Here's the stratum basal, here's the stratum corneum. So uh, the thickness of the epidermis and the skin is, is much thinner, and uh, the layers are generally intact except with the absence of the stratum lucidum. So let's go over each of these layers for thin skin. Here you have the uh, stratum basal. Uh, in this case, the cells in this layer are, are very uh, brown because they contain lots of uh, the skin pigment melanin, which is re partially responsible for uh, complexion in individuals. Darker individuals are going to have more melanin in their cells. Uh, here's the stratum spinosum. The stratum granulosum is thinner and it's not as well defined in thin skin as it is in thick skin and it's not completely continuous so there it's a sort of uh, basophilic but discontinuous layer um, that's just not as well defined in uh, thin skin. There is no stratum lucidum in thin skin, instead you just have the stratum corneum which is this layer right here. So make sure you can identify um, those layers both in thin and in thick skin. There are two cell types that you need to be able to identify uh, in the epidermis of skin. There are other cell types that we're not going to talk about. The most common cell types are, are keratinocytes, which are most of the cells. Uh, those are the cells that um, those in the lower layers have very little keratin, but as they're pushed up to the more superficial layers, uh, their cytoplasm is filled with more and more keratin until um, they basically are just filled with it and the cells themselves are dead. So that's what most of the cells in the different layers are called. Another cell type that you need to know which is, is only found in the stratum basal uh, and those are called melanocytes. Melanocytes are these cells here. Um, uh, melanocytes normally have uh, a very kind of spider, spidery appearance. They have lots of thin cytoplasmic processes which extend to make numerous contacts with nearby adjacent uh, keratinocytes. But when stained with an H and E uh, protocol, they tend to shrink back. And so that leaves a little empty space, which is an artifact of the preparation with an H and E stain. So uh, what appears to be this wider empty space is an artifact, but you can still see the nucleus of the melanocytes, which is this basophilic structure quite well. So these are all melanocytes in the stratum basal. Um, note that melanocytes function is to synthesize uh, melanin and then to deliver that melanin to transport it to other nearby cells. So although the melanocytes produce the melanin, most of the melanin you see is actually in the cytoplasm of nearby keratinocytes, uh, mostly in the stratum basal.
Let's talk now uh, about dermis. There are actually um, two parts to dermis. You have the uh, papillary dermis, which is the more superficial part, and then you have the reticular dermis. The papillary dermis is uh, particularly uh, dense and it gets its name because it extends into these uh, little uh, extensions of the dermis uh, or sort of uh, nipple-like extensions called papillae, which is what uh, papilla refers to. Um, and so you find those, these papillae uh, under the epidermis as part of the papillary dermis. So that's how it gets its name. So um, you can see that in thick skin, in the dermis under thick skin as well. Uh, notice the stratum basal is not straight, it's wavy, and so you have these dermal papillae. Those are those structures uh, immediately underneath the epidermis. So this is papillary dermis. Papillary dermis, reticular dermis. If uh, we ask you to identify them, uh, we, it will be very clear which uh, part we're indicating. So if I uh, point uh, very close underneath the uh, epidermis, then that's papillary dermis. If I point down here, it's reticular dermis. I'm not going to point at a uh, transitional area here. This is a section through the scalp which has a lot of hair. So you can see uh, some uh, hair follicles, which are these structures right here. This white space is actually where the shaft of the hair uh, would be, but the hair is removed in most of these sections. Hair, sh hair is composed of the intermediate filament keratin, and normally the shaft of the hair extends all the way down uh, uh, into the uh, uh, reticular dermis and even into the hypodermis, which is this area underneath the dermis that you see here. So this is the uh, follicle of a hair. You can see other associated glandular structures here. These exocrine glands are called sebaceous glands and they secrete an oily substance called sebum which helps to lubricate and protect the shaft of the hair. Another important structure you need to be able to identify um, are these smooth muscles which are called pyloerector muscles. These uh, are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system only so that when you uh, are excited and your uh, sympathetic tone increases, it, these muscles contract and that's what causes your hairs to stand on end when you get excited or scared. Uh, in this section you can see uh, the interface between the reticular dermis here and the hypodermis. The hypodermis is easy to identify because it contains uh, adipose tissue mostly, so there are lots and lots of adipocytes. Hypodermis is not considered part of the skin. So uh, here you can see the epidermis. Um, but most of the skin is actually formed by, by dermis, particularly reticular dermis. Underneath the dermis, you can actually see the hypodermis, which is not part of the skin. But it's important to be able to identify that structure as well. Here's a higher magnification view of a hair follicle, a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous glands have a, a kind of a characteristic almost honeycomb appearance. Um, due to the very uh, um, interesting geometric arrangement of the cells which are very large and pale and have distinct nuclei. This is a section through the uh, ductal and secretory portions of the sweat gland. Sweat glands are, have a coiled tubular secretory uh, portions which you see here. They are composed of a simple cuboidal epithelium. So here you can see the lumen uh, of this coiled sweat gland in multiple sections. Uh, the ducts of the sweat glands have a rare epithelium which is stratified cuboidal. You can see two layers of cuboidal cells. These cuboidal cells are smaller. They tend to be a bit more eosinophilic, so they're a little darker staining cytoplasm, and the nuclei are smaller 
uh, and often somewhat compressed. So be able to distinguish between the secretory and the ductal portions of uh, eccrine sweat glands. And these can be found um, all throughout the dermis as well as the hypodermis. In some of your sections you may see these, uh, these holes that uh, appear through the epithelium. This is actually where the duct of the sweat gland coils through the epithelium to reach the surface. Um, so uh, that's actually not an artifact, but that's a real structure that you see uh, as, the, as the duct passes through. The skin is also an important sensory organ, so there are numerous types of sensory structures that are associated with it. We're going to talk about two of them that are easy to identify in H&E stain sections. Uh, the most common are uh, these structures here, which are called Meisner's corpuscles. Meisner's corpuscles um, uh, are, consist of layers of, of cells uh, fibroblasts and collagen that surrounds a nerve ending. Uh, to, so this is a type of encapsulated receptor you'll learn about more about later on. And uh, these structures help to sense light discriminative touch. So they, uh, in order to detect touch very sensitively, they are located close to the surface in these dermal papillary regions so that if you compress uh, a very small portion of the epidermis it's going to push specifically on these dermal papillae and that gives you a, a ability to sense a very uh, light discriminative touch. Here's a higher resolution uh, image showing the uh, this Meisner's corpuscle and this uh, dermal papilla. So there are many of them present. They uh, if the contrast isn't particularly good on the slide, they can be a little bit hard to identify, uh, but make sure you can identify uh, these structures, uh, at least under some of the dermal papillae. Uh, you can actually see the granules in, the, in these cells in the stratum granulosum really beautifully on this slide as well. The other sensory structure we're going to look at in skin is found in the reticular dermis, or sometimes they can also be found underneath the reticular dermis and the hypodermis. And these structures are called Pacinian corpuscles. These are much larger than Meisner's corpuscles. There uh, are far fewer of them, though, so they are usually harder to find. Uh, they have a very characteristic kind of onion skin appearance. They have many layers of these membranes. In between those layers are filled with fluid. And so they kind of look like an, an onion that has been sliced in half. So uh, they're fairly uncommon, but uh, you can identify them very eas easily if you see them. These structures are involved in sensing vibration um, and deep touch or pressure, so they don't need to be close to the epithelium to be able to sense that type of stimulation. Here's a higher magnification view, a uh, really nice uh, image of a Pacinian corpuscle. And then finally, we're going to take a look at the mammary glands. Uh, mammary glands sometimes um, are taught along with, uh, with other glandular structures. And in this case, we're including them as part of the integument. So uh, this is a, an inactive mammary gland that is composed mostly of adipose tissue, you can see here, and dense irregular connective tissue, seeing a lot of collagen fibers. There's very little uh, actual glandular epithelium seen here. You can see uh, one duct here. Um, you may see a few ducts, but it's very scant. So this is what uh, mammary tissue looks like from a, f from a f woman that is not actively nursing or pregnant. When a female becomes pregnant, uh, the 
in response to hormones, you get a lot of growth of the glandular epithelium. So you can see that a, an active mammary gland, which is shown here, is far more glandular and much less fibrous. There's still uh, adipose tissue and denser regular connective tissue, but there's lots of uh, gland. You can see lots of ducts. Here's a very large duct and uh, lots of secretory uh, structures. Here's a section through uh, glandular epithelium of an active mammary gland. And here you have both the ducts and the secretory portions of the, of the glandular epithelium. You do need to be able to distinguish between these two structures. Note that the secretory uh, portion of the glands, the cells are much paler in appearance and the nuclei are located towards the basal surface. The ducts have uh, much larger lumens and uh, even though the epithelium is still simple cuboidal and, and both the, these cuboidal cells look quite a bit different. Uh, the cells are much more basophilic overall and the nuclei are located more towards the center of the cell. So be able to distinguish between ducts, which you see here, here, here and here from secretory portions of the gland which you see here, here and here. And that's well, all we have for this week.